Hello good people and welcome to a tutorial that will be all about the Corona node material editor that you may find in the Corona for Cinema 3D version. In this one we'll be taking a look at the node editor that comes with Corona in depth. We'll obviously start at the very beginning by dragging our first material into the Corona node editor and then we'll just take it from there. We'll talk about how nodes work, what are the pros of working with nodes, and then obviously we are going to go over all the fun, really useful features that the Corona Node Material Editor has. Yes, including the awesome material persistency that is just so useful for any kind of workflow there is, really. All right, so let's start at the very beginning by first bringing up the Corona Node Editor. You can bring it up by going under the Corona menu here and selecting the Node Material Editor button. Bam, we got the thing open now, and so we're off to a great start. Right, now let's talk a little bit about the interface here. At the top, we have access to all the menus we have available to us. We'll go over these in more detail at a later point, but for now it's just important for you to know that they are located right here. On the right of them, we have the navigation controls, and then also this nifty little a button that lets you show or hide the properties of the currently selected node, which is this window right here on the right. We then also have this drop down menu here too, but we'll talk more about it at a later point as well. Right, so that's the top menu. Now on the right here, as we've already alluded to, is our node property window. And this window basically shows you the properties of the node you are working on. So basically, if I select my uh, bitmap node here by simply clicking on it, you'll see that the properties window updates to now show me the properties of the currently selected node. If I select the material again by clicking on it, we now have the material properties staring at us again. Now it is important to point out that these properties are absolutely identical to the ones in your regular material editor. So if I, for example, double click on my wood material down here to bring up the standard material editor that's in Cinema 4D, you'll see that these two windows are basically identical. Save for how things are laid out, of course, because in the Corona node editor, the UI space is a little bit more constrained. Point is, the exact same things you have available in the C4D material editor are available to you in the Corona node material editor on the right here. So like if I go into the bitmap shader in the C4D editor, and then if I do the same thing in the node editor by clicking on the bitmap node here, well, you'll see that the properties of these two windows are one to one. They are the same. And so if we had to boil it down, the properties window here is basically a mirror of the C4D material editor. And the changes you make in one immediately reflect in the other. So if I were to change the mix strength parameter in the diffuse channel, so I'm going to select my material, go under the diffuse channel, and I'm going to do the same in the standard material editor here. And if I now start messing with the mix strength slider, you're going to see that both of these parameters are immediately updated in both editors. And it works vice versa too. If I go into the standard material editor and change the mix strength value here, it's going to update the Corona node material properties window as well. So again, making any kind of adjustments in either of these will be reflected in the other. And that goes for deleting shaders, putting in new shaders, or messing around with the sliders and other parameters. Right. And so as far as the layout goes, then we only have one more part to talk about here, and that is actually the part where the magic happens, the canvas area. Now the canvas area is where you'll be working with the actual nodes. So here's where you'll be able to place your bitmaps, your materials, and all the different shaders that you use, and well, just everything node related. And it is nicely represented in the form of nodes, connecting each of the elements that affect each other together with these connections. Now, to navigate the canvas, you can use these buttons up here. Uh, so you can pan around and you can zoom in or out. And that's all fine and dandy, but it might be a bit cumbersome. So you'll be probably happy to know that you can also do the exact same thing with your mouse. So if I click and hold my middle mouse button, I can now pan around the canvas like a pro. And then to zoom in or zoom out, you can just scroll that middle mouse wheel and that will predictably either zoom in or zoom out. Okay then, there's one more thing that I want to mention about the UI here, and that is that it's actually dockable. You see this hamburger icon up here? Well, you can use it to dock the thing anywhere you'd like. So you want to dock it, well, perhaps above the viewport? Well, you can do that really easily. Now to undock it, you just click on the hamburger icon again and select the undock button. 
Right, so we are now hopefully at least somewhat acquainted with the UI. So now let's talk about how we actually use the node editor here. To bring in materials or shaders, you simply need to either drag them in from the material manager. And if you don't have them created, you can just create them the good old fashioned way by going to the Corona menu here, clicking the new material, then you can just drag them in. Or alternatively, you can use the create menu up here to bring in whatever you'd like. So a new material or a new shader. Now, as an alternative to the menu up here, you can also right click anywhere in the empty space in the canvas, and it'll bring up this compact menu where you have what is essentially a shortcut to the create menu. This is actually typically how I personally bring in new shaders, just because once you bring them in this way, uh, you'll see that they'll pop up exactly where you right click. Whereas with the create menu up here, if I bring in a, for example, a noise shader, you'll see that they'll spawn right in the middle of the canvas. And that's still cool, it just depends on how you like to roll. One pro tip at this point, if you want to uh, bring in bitmaps, you can also drag them directly from your Windows or Mac explorers. So I have my bitmap collection open right here, and if I just select one and drag it over to the canvas area and drop it, you see that it'll drop right in. It's quite handy. Right, now this looks like a hot mess right now, so let's clean things up a bit. To delete the nodes, you can uh, select them, then right click on them, and simply select the delete button. Alternatively, you can also select them, hit the delete button on your keyboard, and that will probably be a faster way of deleting them rather than clicking through that menu that we just uh, opened up with our right click. One thing to note though, is that if you do select a connected node and hit delete, well, that is simply going to hide the node. So to undo that and unhide the hidden nodes, I can select the material it was connected to and go under the node menu up here and hit add connections, which will automatically unhide all the connected nodes to this material. If I wanted to bring in all the hidden nodes of all the materials in the canvas, then I could simply go under the view menu here and select add all connections. Or, you know, you can also spam the undo button here uh, in Cinema 4D to go back a few steps until you get to a point before you've hidden something. Okay, now if I right click on a node, uh, you'll see that we in fact have two ways on how to get rid of it. One is to straight up delete it, and the other, if the node is connected to something, is to simply hide it from view. Now you'll see these uh, shortcuts listed here, and they are super, super helpful. But just remember that if a node isn't connected to anything, simply hitting delete on your keyboard will straight out delete it. So for example, if I bring in a color shader here and hit delete while the node is not connected to anything, that means it'll delete this node, even though the shortcut here might imply otherwise. And that is intended behavior as it really makes no sense to hide an unconnected node because that node is then effectively gone. So it's kind of a shortcut for a shortcut in that scenario. And as another tip, these two options right here are also available from the node menu up here. Remove from view and delete. You can use whichever one is handier for you. Now, as far as deleting materials go, well, we'll cover that in more detail a bit later on in the tutorial when we'll be talking about the canvas more in depth. For now though, Let's just say that you should think of the canvas as sort of a work table upon which you place your materials. You can, like with the other nodes, either remove them from view, which will keep them in your material manager and in your scene, or if I undo that, you can straight up delete them and remove them from your scene and your material manager. Now don't worry about all of this, we'll go over the actual production workflows later on. Okay then, on the topic of nodes, let's dive deeper into the actual node system here. So the nodes themselves have some logic to them. As you can see with our normal shader here, nodes can have inputs, which lets you plug in other nodes into them. And then they can also have outputs, which lets you connect a given node into another node. Now to make things more consistent, every node connection you see on the left side of node representation here is an input. And every node connection you see on the right side of the node is an output. 
Now, nodes can have both inputs and outputs, like for example, the normal shader here, or even the material node here. On the other hand, some nodes only have outputs, like the bitmap shader here. As a node though, there are currently no nodes that only have inputs without having outputs too, because even material nodes can be connected into other material nodes, such as, for example, when connecting a corona material into a corona layered material, but more on that later on. Okay, well that covers an important part of the UX. Now let's talk about the actual connections themselves. So as you can see, right now we currently have four nodes in front of us, but none are connected. Because we are trying to create a wooden log material, our plan is to connect these nodes uh, right into the wooden logs material nodes appropriate channels. So to do just that, we simply need to click and drag on the bitmap node here, for example, and just plug it into the appropriate input. So since this is a diffuse map, we'll just plug it into the diffuse slot. Great. And as you can see, our material has now updated and we now have our diffuse map in its correct place, which is the diffuse channels texture slot. And that's a perfect fit. What you've also probably noticed is that our input icons have slightly changed. This circle here is now full, whereas before when nothing was connected to it, the input was sort of empty, like it is now. And so that is a good way to see if there is something plugged into an input. So if I replug this bitmap, hide the node like we've demonstrated before, so right clicking on it, remove from view, you can see that now that input is still communicating that something is plugged into it. So now I can just select the material node, go under the node menu, and just add the hidden connection. So add connections button. And so now this hidden bitmap will be back in our canvas. So yeah, it's useful to understand these basic UI principles because they can indeed come in handy. Okay, one more thing, just to make sure we fully understand it. So in order to unplug the already established connections, we simply need to click and hold on the connection and then release it somewhere on the empty canvas space. And just like that, the node is unplugged. Now, it does matter where you've clicked on the connection, because if you click on it closer to the input here, so somewhere around here, they'll disconnect it from the input. But if you've clicked on it closer to the output of the bitmap, so around here somewhere, then it will unplug from the output. So understanding that can potentially save you some mindless clicking right there. Okay, then let's go back to our material here. To make a proper material, we also need some faint reflections. But as you can see, there are no additional node inputs available on our material here in the node editor. Well, why is that? Well, by default, your materials will come in with only the diffuse channel enabled. So exactly the same as in the C4D material editor. Now to have the ability to have reflections, we need to enable the reflection channel by taking it on under the basic tab here. So like this. And as you've probably noticed, all of a sudden we have a bunch more inputs available here. If we go into the reflection channel properties here, you'll see where all these inputs are coming from. So any slot you can plug something into is basically an input in the Corona node editor. And the order of the slots is identical too. So basically, first up is the reflection texture slot. And it matches to the first slot we have available in the node material editor. Next is the Fresnel IOR slot. And as you can see, it also matches the next slot in the node material editor. And the same goes for the glossiness slot and all the slots that come after it. Needless to say, this is the case for all the materials and shaders. And it makes plugging things a bit easier because if you're used to the order from the standard C4D editor, well, the same order applies to the node inputs. Now, you've probably noticed there is some color coding to our inputs and outputs. And the idea here is simple. All the inputs uh, and outputs of the same color can be connected to each other. Right, so let me bring in a glossiness map for our wood material here, for our wooden log. So this is the glossiness map, I'll just drag it in. And so going by the color coding logic, connecting the bitmap here, so the orange sort of 
output into the orange input makes perfect sense. Orange to orange, and that works. Well then, we also have these gray input-like icons here too. Well, these aren't actual inputs because I can't plug anything into them. And so these are actually just representing their channel. So in our case, the reflection channel here. Now, because the reflection channel has more than just one slot you can plug something into, this gray icon sort of shows you that all of the slots below it are part of the reflection channel. You can also observe that the slots on the uh, channel are slightly indented inward, which makes them even easier to recognize. Now, if I were to enable the bump channel here, uh, so I'm going to go under the basic tab and enable the bump channel. You see that now we have just this one input here that says bump. There are no other slots below it, and it is not grayed out like the reflection channel input is. Well, why is that? Well, if you go under the bump channel uh, in the node properties window here, you'll see that there is just one slot to be used here. So basically the logic here is that if you can plug only one thing under a certain channel, you'll just have that lonesome input in the node editor too because there are no other inputs in that channel, right? And so the same goes true for the diffuse channel. If we go under its channel uh, properties window here, we'll see that, yeah, there are a bunch of properties in here like the color and the mix strength and all that, but ultimately there's just one single slot we can plug anything into. And so the diffuse input field is also singular. And so it just isn't grayed out and it doesn't have any sub slots, if you will. Now, if we were to enable, say, the volumetrics channel, which has multiple slots, as we can see, one for the absorption texture and one for the scattering texture, well, now we get that grayed out channel input field saying anything underneath it is related to the volumetrics channel. And if you feel like the multiple input fields uh, here are clogging your UI up, well, then you can simply click on this arrow here and collapse that stack. It'll still work as before, it's just your UI will look a little less cluttered. All right, now let me undo all that. Let me expand all these tags and let me disable the volumetrics because having volumetrics turned on on a piece of wood, well, it's a bit freaky. And okay, let's talk about the purple input and output fields. The purple fields are all about connecting materials together. And as you guessed it, you can only connect purple to purple. You do that enough times and you'll get purple rain playing in the background. No, just kidding, you won't. But anyway, to better showcase how these work, I'll bring in a layered material. So I'm going to go under Create, New Material, and Layered Material. And all right, you can probably immediately see where we'll be able to connect our material output to. So it'll be any of these purple slots. And automatically, you won't be able to connect them to these orange slots. It just won't let you because these are actually for shaders. We could plug in bitmaps in here or Fresnel shaders or just whatever, really, as long as it's a shader, just not materials because orange connects to orange and purple connects to purple. And so that is the general idea behind the color coding of the inputs and outputs. You can't really go wrong and connect things together that can't be connected, but the color coding will still help you in quickly knowing which output can connect to which input or vice versa. Right, so believe it or not, you now know pretty much all you need to know to start connecting things together and start making some really awesome material setups. Now let's take all that knowledge and let's talk about why nodes are so super useful and why the Corona node editor is special compared to other node editors that you have in Cinema 4D. And spoiler alert, in no small part, that is because of its unique canvas that acts more like a work table on which you place your materials. So in front of us is this wooden board, if you will, and we have our material in the canvas right here. Okay. So we already have our bitmap imported too, and it's this diffuse map right here. It obviously needs to plug into the diffuse slot, so let's do that by clicking and holding on its output and dragging it into the diffuse input of our material here. Great. Now, let's say this map is all we've got, and we obviously need to create at least somewhat of a plausible bump map out of it. 
So the first thing would be to create a filter shader. So I'm going to right click in the canvas, go under the new shader menu option and select the filter shader. Right. We're using the filter shader because we need to create a black and white bitmap out of our existing bitmap, which is obviously, which obviously has color. So let's connect our bitmap into our filter shaders input. And while we have our filter selected, let's just tune down the saturation to zero, which is effectively going to create that black and white image that we're after. Perfect. Now let's connect this bad boy to the bump slot. Just like that. And there we go. We have our bump map working. Now, obviously a proper bump map would be more accurate, but sometimes these kind of adjustments work just fine, depending on the material, of course. And okay, well, now we're still missing a proper glossiness map, which is sort of the basic map you need for your material. So let's quickly create another filter for it. So right clicking new shader filter, and I'm going to connect the bitmap into the filter. And in the filter, again, I'm going to create a black and white map, but this time I'm also going to mess with the gamma just a little bit, just so we get something a little bit more brighter going on. Okay, so this could be our glossiness map. So let's plug it into the glossiness slot. And there we go. We've created our first material using nodes. And so the power of nodes can really be felt here. Just by taking a look at these connections in the node editor, it gives me an incredibly good idea of how this material is made up. We only have one map plugged into two filter shaders, and each of these filter shaders is plugged into either the glossiness slot or the bump slot. And so, as you can see, I can read this pretty quickly here because nodes in general give you a really good overview of your setups. So if I compare these connections to the material representation in the standard material editor, bring it over. Well, as you can see, I need to go through all the channels here to kind of get the idea of what exactly is happening. And yeah, this is obviously a super simple material, but what if we had a lot more shaders and bitmaps here? Well, you can probably imagine that with the standard material editor, you'd have to explore each and every hierarchy to get a good idea of what is happening. So comparatively, nodes can really be helpful in giving you a better idea of what is going on in your materials. Sure, you do need to get used to them if you haven't worked with nodes before, but it's most definitely worth it. What is also great is we are using the same app to drive both filter shaders. And why is that useful? Well, let's just say we wanted to use a slightly different bitmap here. So let me just quickly change the existing one with a, with a bit of a different one. All right, there we go. And so as you can see, just by changing the one bitmap, we are now feeding those same filter shaders that are desaturating our textures. We are feeding them with a different texture. And so the entire material, including the glossiness and bump maps have updated. So if you were using the standard editor to create a similar material and make similar adjustments, you'd need to go under the diffuse channel, change the bitmap here to the one you'd like, and then repeat the same procedure for all the, the other channels. So we'd need to go under the reflection channel, under the glossiness slot, under the filter hierarchy here, and then change the bitmap here as well. And then do the same thing for the bump channel as well, go under the filter here and change the bitmap for another bitmap. So that involves a lot of extra steps because with the standard material editor, you simply can't create those dependencies where one node feeds another. And so while this is an extremely simplified example, you can already see how nodes can help you skip a few steps by creating dependencies between the different shaders, which makes adjusting things a lot easier. But wait, there's a lot more to it. So say you are working on an interior shot and you have two different colored walls in the same room. As you can see, right now we have two different materials in the canvas, but both are using the same normal map that creates that nice plaster bruising. Now, let's say we want a different plaster texture on both of these. Well, in that case, you just hop into this normal map here and into the bitmap shader, change this bitmap for another one. And voila, we changed one texture where we've updated both of the materials because both are connected to this one normal bitmap. And so the showcase here is that these node dependencies work in extremely useful ways, like having a bitmap driving two different materials. Now, what is even cooler is that we can have the same approach when applying dirt imperfections on these. So let me bring in a dirt map here. 
I'm just going to drag it from my Windows Explorer into my canvas here. And now let's do some node magic here. So I'm going to right click in the empty space in the canvas and I'm going to go under new shader. I'm going to bring in a new layer shader. And then I'm also going to bring in a new shader, color shader. And the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the wall B material here under the diffuse channel. I'm just going to copy its color and paste it onto my newly created color shaders color here. And there we go. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this color shader and plug it into the layer shader. And I'm going to do the same with the third bitmap here. I'm just going to plug it in to the layer here. And then I'm going to click on the layer shader to bring up its uh, properties window here. And as you can see, this is the standard Cinema 4D layer shader. And the only thing that I'm going to change in here is the blending mode of our dirt map, which is essentially going to go from normal to a multiply blending mode, just because that's going to create a bit more of a realistic result for us here. Great. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to repeat the same procedure for our wall A material here, but I'm not just going to recreate all of these shaders. And instead, I'm just going to copy them because that's going to be a bit quicker. So to copy them, you just uh, need to select them and hold the control or command buttons on your keyboard, a command if you're on Mac, of course, and then just clicking and dragging and then letting go. And that's going to copy it. I'm going to do the same for the layer shader here. And now once we've copied them, I'm going to go under my wall A material, under the diffuse channel, copy the color here and paste it into our color shader. There we go. Now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, plug this color shader into the layer shader and bring in that same dirt map into this layer shader as well. Great. Now let's just adjust the blending modes here again to multiply. And now the only thing we have to do is we need to plug both of these layers into uh, their respective materials. And there we go. Right. And as you can see, we now have the same dirt map applied to both of our materials here. And that is because we are using that one bitmap and plugging it into the two layer shaders that are driving the respective materials diffuse textures. So now what we've created is a fun way to keep the same dirt texture on both of these wall materials here uh, and still keep the ability to quickly add more dirt maps if we wanted to or just changing the walls colors real quickly and stuff like that. Now, if you are a skilled user, you're probably thinking we could do this a little bit differently. And so what we could also do is we could not have the color plugged into the layer shader here. We could have the bitmap set to be just on a normal blending mode. And then we could set the mix mode here under the material to, to multiply. And this is perfectly valid. And it essentially uh, makes the node editor a little less busy because we don't need the color node here. But what we are uh, losing in this case is the extra uh, mix mode abilities that we otherwise have in our layer shader, right? So that's why um, typically this is the setup that I personally go with. Now, uh, since we've unplugged the color shader here, uh, we need to replug it. And once we've done that, we can see that these inputs are actually not sort of how we wanted them to be. The color is on, on top of the dirt map here. So what we can do then is just simply go into the layer shader and just move this guy below the dirt map, which makes more sense as we are applying the dirt on our color. Now, an extra cool thing about the setup is that we can actually replace our bitmap here with another one. And that's going to, again, update both of our materials. So let's say that I'm not happy with this dirt map and I'm, I want to replace it. So I'm going to select the bitmap node here. I'm going to bring in or better yet, I'm going to replace this one with another one. So let's say I like this bitmap here. I'm just going to drag it on top of our file slot here and just release it. And that's essentially going to replace our node or better yet, our bitmap. And as you can see, just by, just by replacing this one bitmap, both of the materials now updated. And again, this is because the node editor allows you to create these fun dependencies that can really save you time and really allow you to focus on the creative aspects of things. Because just again, imagine doing the same procedure using the standard material editor. You would need to go in and essentially through this entire hierarchy, replace the bitmap, and then repeat the same procedure for the, the other material. 
And you know, this it just involves a lot more extra steps. And also the overview of what is actually going on is, well, a lot worse in the standard material editor. And also, don't forget, we're dealing with a relatively simple material setup here. Imagine if you had the dirt map also driving the glossiness map, which is something you'd probably do to break up the reflections a bit. Well, in that case, you'd need to change the bitmap in the diffuse slot, and then also the reflection slot. And don't forget, you need to make changes in both materials. And so the standard material editor can be a bit cumbersome to use in these scenarios. So again, for more complicated setups, nodes can really help you. Okay then, we've covered quite a bit so far and I'm really excited about it because now you know a fair bit about the Corona node editor here. That said, we still have to talk about one very, very important feature. We need to talk about what makes the Corona node editor super special. And that is how its canvas works. So we've already briefly touched on our good old buddy, the canvas before, and we've actually already used its special sauce power while showcasing examples just a couple of minutes ago. But I think it's time we really get into it now. So let's do that. To have a better understanding of how things work, let's just think about how material node editors typically work in Cinema 4D. And this goes for both the native node editor as well as many other third party node editors. So as you can see here, I have two node materials and I, saw, I also have the Cinema 4D node editor window open. Now the editor itself is grayed out, so I can't really use it until I actually select a material. Once I select it, the editor is good to go to edit this specific material. Now if I wanted to also edit the other material here, the only thing I can do is, is to select it and then work on it. Now this is all great, but some of you probably already see what is up here. You can't really feed both of these materials with the same nodes. So for example, if I drag a texture in here, so just a random texture into the node editor, I then cannot connect this node, the same texture node into this other material because to edit the other material, I need to select it. And once that happens, we only see the nodes of the currently selected material. And so while this is a perfectly fine workflow and it still allows you to work with nodes, which is great, the Corona node editor aims to give you something different due to its canvas and how it offers persistency when it comes to its nodes. So with the Corona node editor, the nodes are persistent, meaning if I create a new material, so Corona, new material, and then I place it into my Corona node editor onto its canvas, this material will stay here until I either remove it from view or just straight up delete it out of my scene. And so that's why you can think of it as a canvas. It's like placing a piece of wood on the workbench in real life. You place it on there, then you add stuff to it. So maybe a color shader, give it a red color, connect it, and you know, just tweak it. And then maybe what you can also do is you can bring in more wood, so another material, and then nail or glue all the pieces together however you see fit. Ultimately, and we've shown this in our previous examples, this gives you a lot of flexibility. And all of this becomes even more useful when dealing with more complex material structures. So let's try to drive the point home here. In this car scene in front of us, let's say we want to work on the studio floor slash background material bit. So basically the studio cyclorama. Well, to do that, we need to find the material we want in the material manager and drag this bad boy onto the canvas. Voila, it's in here and ready to be tweaked. So maybe I want to change the color Right, it's diffuse color to something a bit more yellowish. So yeah, let's say that's looking cool, but now I'd like to change the car color as well, because it, we could kind of play with the color scheme here, right? So the power of the canvas is going to be showcased right here. So what I'll do is I'll just find the car paint material here under my layers that I've neatly prepared here. And under car paint, I have uh, the layered material, which is, consists of the coat and base material. So I'm just going to drag it in here. Perfect. Now, because the car paint is actually a layered material, it is made up of two different materials. Because quite frankly, that's how metallic car paints are made with a bit more of a, a rougher base and a very glossy coating. Well, anyway, all of that node structure of the layered material now got transferred in. 
And so now, because I was kind of smart and I've used a color shader to drive the reflection of both the materials, I can now easily tweak the color here. So let me kind of um, tweak it to be a bit more bluish. And voila, everything updates accordingly. Now, the point that I'm trying to convey here is that the canvas allows us to have all of these materials right in front of us. And that's because it behaves like a table on which you place things. So now if I wanted to tweak the floor slash background material again, I don't need to go back uh, in, in my material manager here and drag it back in, nor do I need to click on it to show up in the Corona node editor. Why? Well, canvas folks, the material is exactly where we've left it in the canvas along with the car paint material. So now I can just click on it, tweak its color just a little bit, maybe make it a bit more orangish and a bit more saturated. And so as you can see, now I can very quickly access both of these materials and uh, tweak them, right? And so if this was a complexer material or we had even more materials, we could just simply drag them in here and they would all stay in our canvas. Heck, if you wanted to, you could even plug this color shader that drives the uh, car paint color here and plug it into the studio material, into its diffuse slot, right? And so now you're controlling what, like one, two, three, four materials directly from this one material node editor view. And so that's kind of the flexibility that the canvas offers you. And so again, you can really drag as many materials and shaders and bitmap textures in here while having all the relevant materials right in front of you. And that really allows you to create some pretty interesting material trees, material shaders, however you want to call them, and still retain that flexibility. All right, we've checked many things off our list here. You now know a lot about the Corona Node Editor, including some of its finer points. Now let's take that knowledge and take it for a spin in a more production-like workflow. We'll also learn about some of the more nifty advanced things about it along the way too. So we'll be working with the scene that you see in front of us here this kind of cozy interior. It's obviously not quite finished, and well, we'll get it through the finish line here. First off, let's finish off this wall here, as it's currently just a plain white material. So let's bring up the Corona node editor, and then let's create a new Corona material. So under Corona, new material, and let's name this guy wall material. Okay, great. Now let's apply this newly created wall material to our wall meshes, which all reside under the architecture walls null here. So I'll just drop it on there. All right. Now one extra thing that I want to do here is I want to adjust the projection. I want to switch it from UV mapping to cubic. But while it's being flat and all, I typically just put the projection to cubic here so that any textures that we'll use in our materials don't get stretched. And this way, we also don't need to UV unwrap the thing at all. Well, all right. Um, now let's drag our newly created material onto our canvas here and let's start noting things up. First off, let's give it some color. So I'll go into the diffuse slot here and I'll tweak the color to something, well, a bit grayish, but with a touch of yellowish warmth. So maybe I'll just up the saturation here to about 8% or so. There we go. It's kind of getting that nice yellow orangeish look to it. Now, I'm very particular about my walls, and so the value I tend to keep around 70%, just so that we don't get those super bright walls that look like they emit light. So if I up this value to 90 something percent, you can kind of see now it kind of looks like they are emitting light. So typically, I like to keep this value, even for freshly painted walls, well below 80%. And great. I think this kind of looks cool already. We do need some reflections, however, so let's enable the reflection channel under the basic tab, reflections, tick it on, and then let's plug in a good glossiness map in here, because right now the reflections are super, super glossy. For a wall like this, I'll go with a bit of a dirt texture, so let me drag one in. There we go. And now let me connect it to the wall materials glossiness slot, which is going to break up these reflections a little bit. There we go. 
Now, uh, let's go out of our camera here. So I'm just going to switch to the default viewport camera, which is basically just going to switch the view to a bit more of an angled view so that we can uh, see the reflections a little bit better here uh, because they're, we're looking at them from a bit more of a grazing angle. And as you can see, this, this is already too dirty, on uh, even on first glance. We've got some nasty tenants here. And so let's clean this up, shall we? Well, what I'll do here is I'll bring in a Corona Color Mix shader. So I'm going to right click in the canvas here, new shader, whoopsie, new shader, plugins, Corona, and Color Mix. Great. Now, what I still need to do is I need to connect the bitmap shader into the Color Mix and the Color Mix into the glossiness slot. Now, this uh, shader will enable me to control the mixture of the map with the color here that you see here. So basically we'll reduce the strength of the map by adjusting the mix strength slider here. Now we could also use the, for example, the filter shader to do the same thing, but hey, I find the color mix shader to be great for this kind of uh, a job. So let me tweak these values here a bit. So I'll first reduce the mix strength to say about, let's do some region rendering here. And uh, a quick tip here, if whenever you're using the uh, fast preview denoise during render and you're doing detailed work, sometimes you're actually going to find that uh, disabling it is kind of perhaps going to give you a bit of a better idea of how things are looking a bit faster because it's not going to denoise the details so, uh, so much, right? So um, let's continue with our dirt tweaking here. And I can kind of see the dirt faintly here. I hope the compression is not killing uh, sort of the, the video output here. I, what I see here is just some faint dirt coming uh, through, right? Now, uh, everything is just a little too glossy. So I'm going to adjust the brightness of this color. I could also just go in, in into the color and adjust the value. But I'm just going to adjust the brightness of it here just like this, maybe to around 60%. And well, maybe we need more dirt on that. So I'll just up the mix strength to like maybe 25%. And so what I'm seeing here is essentially, I'm, I'm getting some dirt through, but it's very faint, but just enough to make this wall sort of slightly dirty. All right, well, we could obviously still tweak this, but as, a, as the next thing that I want to do to this wall is I want to bring in a normal map. So let me bring it in from my Windows Explorer here. I'm just going to drag it in. And this is just a, you're probably not going to be able to see it because of the video compression here, but it's just a normal map uh, of a plaster wall from Megascans. So I think it'll work great to kind of add those nice little bumps and imperfections on top of the, uh, of the wall material here. So what I need to do is I need to bring in a new shader, plugins, Corona, and a normal map shader. And then I need to plug in this normal bitmap into the normal shader, and then the normal shader into the bump slot. But we don't have it, so what I'll actually need to do is I'm going to have to go under the wall material here, basic, and enable the bump channel. And now I can plug this normal map right in. And so, yeah, this is looking cool already. It's really hard to spot this uh, normal map uh, doing its thing. Maybe we could uh, go under the bump channel, maybe up the strength just a little bit, but this is a subtle detail, so I'm not going to worry about it just too much. But overall, right now, this is, everything is just looking rather cool, uh, but I, I guess we could add some dirt on top still. So maybe in the diffuse slot, I could I could plug in this dirt map because where the wall is less glossy, there is usually dirt there. And so maybe those parts of the wall are just a little bit more darker. Well, again, this is a perfect time for nodes here to shine, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click in my canvas again, bring in a new layer shader, and I'm also going to bring in a new color shader. And you've seen me use this technique before, uh, where I then go under the sort of... Uh, the, the material here and under the diffuse channel, copy its color, paste it into the color shader, and then uh, drag this color shader into the layer here. Let me move this guy out of the way here. And then just drag this dirt map on top of our color. Then drag this entire 
thing into the diffuse slot of our wall material. So this is going to look really rough because obviously uh, we're not blending in these two sort of properly, right? So the first thing that I want to change here is to, is to switch from the normal blending mode to multiply. And then I could just tweak uh, the strength here to maybe something around 10% or so. And um, let's give it a second to render. Yeah, and you can kind of see now we have these sort of slightly darker spots on our wall, right? And this kind of looks really, really cool to me. So let's go back into our uh, original camera. Let's take a look. And yeah, great. I think we are done with the wall. Now, remember, again, we've used the node editor here and helped ourselves out. Everything is very clean to read, as we can see all the nodes we've used. And we've even created a nice dependency by using the same third map here to drive two other material properties here. So we are kind of putting dirt into the glossiness slot. And so that affects, well, a property that is in the reflection channel. And then we are also using that same dirt map to kind of add some imperfections to the diffuse component of our material as well. And so because of this dependency that we've created, if we are not happy with our diffuse map, we can just change this bitmap here to something else. And that's going to update uh, both our diffuse properties as well as our classiness properties here. All right, now for an extra tip here, you're going to see that we have this filter shader up here that's kind of not connected to anything. And let's say, for example, that we've also had a layer shader that isn't connected to anything and a, well, another filter shader. Why not, right? Let's say we have all of these guys in here sort of all in our way and making things look weird and, well, just hard to read in general. Well, in that case, you can simply use the Corona Node Editor's built-in feature um, to remove all of these unconnected nodes. So if I go under the Node menu here, or I'm sorry, the View menu here, you can uh, select the Delete Unused Shaders button. And that's simply going to delete all of the unconnected shaders for you. Now you can use the same uh, sort of functionality to delete the unused material. So if I, for example, create a new Corona material and drag it in here, and this guy is not applied anywhere in our object manager. So it's not, and it's not connected to anything in here. So if I go under view and do delete unused materials command, you're going to see that it's going to just delete it from our scene. And so that's a pretty cool, uh, useful organizational tip for you right there. Right, now let's focus on the floor material next. And just so you know, we've actually went into the render settings here and we've re-enabled the fast preview denoise during render option, uh, just because we'll use the denoiser to speed up our presentation here uh, as we won't be focusing that much on the details moving forward. And I just wanted to let you know that. Okay, if I open up the hierarchy of our floor setup here in the object manager, so if you go under the architecture floor null here, then under the floor generator null, Floor generator is a pretty neat plugin. I recommend you check it out, by the way. If we, get, if, if we then go under the ball generator and under the null null, you're going to see that what we have in here is basically an infinite amount of these tiles. And so if I jump out of my camera and take a closer look at my floor here, you're going to see that my floor is actually made up of these individual planks, these individual tiles, if you will. And so this is a probably a perfect time to use the multi-shader uh, to kind of drive our material. And if you don't know how, to, how the multi-shader works, well, we have a tutorial about it, so you can always go brush up your knowledge about it. But still, it's going to be a fairly simple material setup that we'll be doing here, so I'd strongly encourage you to follow along here. Right, so let's jump back into our main camera and let's uh, bring the interactive render over here. Let's create a new Corona material. Let's call this one floor material. And then let's drag this guy into our node material editor. Now things are a little bit messy here, so let's just rearrange things real quickly here. There we go. And now uh, let's apply this uh, floor material to our uh, null here. So I'm just going to uh, click and drag for my preview here, which is something you can do. This is a quick tip, if you will. You can just drag your material onto the null here, which uh, 
has these tiles, these planks nested, that's going to be good enough for now. Now, the next thing that we should do here is we should bring in a multi shader. So to bring in the multi shader, I'm just going to right click in the canvas, go under new shader, plugins, Corona, and then Corona multi shader. Great. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to plug this guy into the floor material under its diffuse slot here, and the interact render is going to update. And bam, you can kind of see that the multi shader is working. Now, uh, again, if you want to learn more about the multi shader, go check out our multi shader tutorial. But for now, the probably the most important thing for you to know is that the multi shader is just going to take, uh, well, the multi shader has these inputs in here uh, where the textures are going to go. And then these textures are getting applied on a per object basis. And so basically, we'll be using this one shader to drive the variation of every plank that we have in our floor setup. So uh, the next thing that we got to do here is we got to bring in some textures. So I'm going to hit the batch load textures button here. And as you can see, I already have my textures in front of me. So I'm just going to select all of these and hit open. And this is going to bring uh, these guys in. Now you're going to see that things are getting a little bit messy here already. And so one thing you can do at this point where things are kind of overlapping and they're just not tidy in general. Well, what you can do is you can select all these nodes, go under view here and uh, just hit this sort all nodes button here. And that's going to automatically sort them. Right now. Well, actually, uh, to be fair, I don't even think you need to have all these nodes selected. So if I go under view, sort all nodes. Yeah, you don't even have to select all of these nodes. That was a bit of a brain fart on my part, if you will. So yeah, now we have all our nodes selected. And as, as you can see, our interactive renderer updated and it's looking real nice already. Now we do need some reflections, obviously. So what we're going to do is we're going to, to go under our floor material under uh, the basic menu here, tab, and then hit reflection. Now, uh, a quick tip uh, here is that you can always resize the node properties window uh, just by hitting uh, or better yet, just by uh, hovering over this vertical line here. You can always resize it as you see fit. And uh, so we're actually going to plug something into the gloss in a slot because we need a gloss in this map because this is, well, this is just not looking that cool. We could, we could always lower the gloss in this level here, but that's not going to have quite enough detail in here. So a, a map in the gloss in the slot is something that typically most of us do all the time. So uh, let's bring in a new shader. Uh, plugins, Corona, Corona multi shader, and let's batch load some textures here. I'm actually going to go and bring in my glossiness maps. And there we go. And again, this is everything's messy here, which is perfectly normal. Uh, but let me just connect this guy into the glossiness slot here. This is the glossiness slot. Yep. And now let me just sort all of these nodes. And there we go. Now I do want to bring these guys uh, together just a little bit more. But as you can see, we now have our floor material starting to look like the real deal. Now, obviously, you could bring in bump maps. You could tweak the glossiness effect even further. You could tweak the reflections and, and do all that. But for all intents and purposes, this is a really good starting point. And it's already looking uh, pretty cool, if you ask me. Now, whenever we talk about organizing things on the canvas, we need to talk about views too. And views are all about this drop down menu up here, which currently says we're in our default view. And the default view is the one that's going to pop up for you by default, as the name suggests, once you open up your Corona Node Material Editor. And so we've been using the default view for everything we've done so far in this tutorial. Now, if you go under the view menu here and hit create view and just hit OK here, this is going to create a new view for us. And so now we have this new view and our previous default view. Now, if we go in my new view, you're going to see that it's completely empty. There's nothing in here. And so at this point, you're perhaps wondering, well, why is this useful to you? Well, it can really help you organize things a little bit better. So let me show you what I mean. If I, for example, go under my new view here and go under the view menu button here, hit rename view and call this one walls. So basically we, we renamed the view to so that it's now called walls view. 
And now we can drag in our wall material in here. And if we had another wall material, so for example, wall B material, and a, a, another wall material, so wall C material, and we had all these in here. Well, now you can kind of see that when we're working in this view, we're only working with our walls. So now this makes things a lot more tidy, right? Because if you have a bunch of uh, materials that fall in, under the same category, you might reuse some of the shaders or something like that. And in that case, separating these materials out in their own view can become really beneficial because as you've seen, uh, things can get cluttered fairly fast if you work on a ton of materials. So for example, if I bring out, uh, bring in these uh, window materials here, bring in all these fireplace materials in here, well, you can see now things can get a little bit messy and you can always help yourselves out with the sort all notes command. Uh, but again, uh, you know, things uh, will get a little bit cluttered, especially if you don't go in and once you've finished working on a material and you don't remove it from view and, and, and do all that stuff, right? Well, unless you do that, things can get cluttered here. And so splitting things out into their own views can be really beneficial for you. Right. So that covers almost all of the most important topics that come to mind when we are talking about the Corona Node Material Editor. We are at the end of our tutorial here. Just before we let you go, let's quickly just showcase a use case for the Corona Node Material Editor that you probably haven't thought of. So in front of us, you'll see we have this Cinema 4D scene that's made up to be used with the physical render. And so that means all of our materials here are actually our default Cinema 4D materials. Now, if I bring up the Corona Node Material Editor, if I drag one of these default Cinema 4D materials in here, you're going to see that they drop in just fine. And so what this means is you can actually use the Corona Node Material Editor to edit Cinema 4D materials as well. And all the functionality that we just talked about with the material persistency and uh, using different views here, well, all of that works just fine as well. So if you ever want to edit Cinema 4D materials in the Corona Node Material Editor, well, you'll be pleased to know that you can do that. And you know what? There is one extra thing we haven't quite talked about, and it can be an awesome workflow addition, and that is the ability to copy multiple nodes at the same time. So if I select these two nodes here and hold down Control on Windows or Command on Mac and just drag these somewhere else on the canvas and then let go, well, you can see that both of these nodes got duplicated and the connection between them got preserved, which is really great because now you don't need to re reconnect these nodes again. But with that said, as you can see, our bitmap shader, our texture didn't get carried over. And so these here are basically not doing anything as the filter node doesn't have an input plugged into it. Now, if I were to copy all the three nodes up here, well, as you can imagine, it'll copy all of them and preserve the connections between all three of them. So by copying all the three nodes here, including the bitmap, well, now we've got all these connections preserved. So whenever you're duplicating stuff, you needn't worry about the connections because as long as you've selected all of the nodes you want to copy, the connections will be preserved between those nodes that you just copied. Okay, so with that quick tip right there, we are signing off here. We sincerely hope you've enjoyed this tutorial and even more importantly, that you've learned all you wanted to learn about the Corona Node Material Editor. The Node Editor is so crucial in modern workflows where you deal with all kinds of materials and the Corona Node Material Editor brings some really unique features to the table. Besides the actual node workflow, which is a highlight of its own, the way that the materials stay persistent, well, that can make for some really interesting time-saving workflows. Thank you for tuning in, and until next time, take care.